Hello there, my fellow Space Maori Marines, and welcome to your weekly dose of chapter lore. This time on the third episode on the mysterious and brutal Carcharodons. For the topics of today's video, we are gonna go over another set of very interesting aspects, in my opinion, concerning this unique chapter. And by those, I'm talking about their combat doctrine, their beliefs, and at least one theory concerning their gene seed. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us continue learning about them, shall we? Tactically, during the Badab War, the Karkarodons operated almost exclusively as a rapid strike force, disdaining any kind of protracted engagement whenever possible, preferring to approach their targets either with extreme speed or by stealth, which allowed them to strike with the element of surprise on their side. Those few who observe a Karkarodon assault and live would be forgiven for assuming they are mindless berserkers, unconcerned with tactics or planning. In fact, the Karkarodons rely on a series of tactics that, at their heart, are both simple and reliable. Though they seem both competent and familiar with armored vehicles, the core of their tactics relies on large detachments of mobile Space Marine Heavy Infantry. In this way, the Karkarodons make use of the bloody prowess of their combat brethren to carry the day in battle. They often endeavor to be the initiator of such combat actions, and prefer not to fight on the defensive. Tactical operations often begin with a battle company using its integrated scout marine elements and other reconnaissance units like land speeders and bike squads to probe enemy positions, identify weak points, and any target with strategic value. Once identified, the Karkarodon's main force hits these points with overwhelming attacks, is chewing preparatory bombardments or armored spearheads in favor of complete and overwhelming surprise. They may use drop pods, thunderhawks, or mass teleportation to make these attacks, and the assaulting forces are often a mix of tactical, assault, and terminator veterans. Depending on the success of these assaults, the Karkarodons usually follow two responses. If the targeted positions are well defended, the Karkarodons withdraw. These withdrawals happen almost as fast as the assault itself, and the Karkarodons fade from the battlefield like a ghost. They patiently reevaluate the might of the enemy positions, and launch another lightning assault at a different point they perceive to be weaker. Eventually, one of these assaults finally succeeds, and then the Karkarodons press the attack to the hilt. Once they fully commit, they dig deep into the enemy's vitals, endeavoring to do as much damage as possible, especially to the vulnerable rear areas, as quickly as possible. At this point, the full fury of the Karkarodons is in full effect, and little, if anything, survives this stage of the assault. The Karkarodons prefer fighting at close range, either attacking with point-blank weapons fire, or in melee when they have broken through the enemy line. There is one other interesting and somewhat disturbing detail about the Karkarodons' assaults. Their battles are conducted in complete silence. Any commands from the chapter's leaders are transmitted over a locked and encrypted voxnet and the Battle Brothers abstain from issuing any word or sound to friend or foe. To see such carnage, enacted without a word or cry, is chilling to say the least. When undergoing boarding operations during ship-to-ship -ship battles, the Karkarodons are known to employ an ancient and crude, but unique weapon known as Ursus Claws large barbed lances that are the size of small escort ships in their own right. Fashioned like massive harpoons, these lances puncture through the enemy vessel's hull, and once impaled, the immense spears become active, locking to their prey ravaged insides with magnetic power. With malicious slowness, the Karkaradan vessel can then recall their spears as the lances ratchet back towards the vessel that fired them 
dragging them home on massive chains. Once the doomed vessel is within reach of the Carcharmodons, they can disgorge their Astartes onto the bowels of the impaled ship, and the blooding begins in earnest. This tactic might sound a bit familiar to you, as it was a tactic used by the World Eaters in the Great Crusade. Despite their long isolation from the Imperium, the chapter and its battle brothers seem deeply, almost incredibly loyal. Most of their encounters have shown reverence towards the Imperial Creed and places of Imperial worship. Many also make a habit of carrying devotional items like prayer scrolls on their war gear. To the Karkaradon's Astra, the Emperor was Rangu, the Void Father, sire of the Forgotten One. Like the Karkaradons, his vigilance was eternal, a beacon in the night, the bane of encroaching shadow. Their chapter has left humanity for the emptiness of the outer dark when he still walked among mortals, and they will not fully return until he does so again. Only with the coming of the Forgotten One could the Edicts of Exile be overturned, and the chapter's eternal crusade in the darkness be brought to an end. The Carcharodons Astra are a faithful brotherhood, even by the standards of the Adeptus Astartes. Their creed is an ancient one, older than the superstitious and misbeliefs of the current imperial cult. Theirs is not some blind faith based on hollow praise and lavish donation. Their memories of the Emperor are of a living, breathing Titan, and Terra is far more to them than some distant hub of galaxy-spanning bureaucracy. Their connection to it is ancient and primal. It has sustained their loyalty and their determination for 10,000 years, amidst the loneliness of the Outer Dark. When they had first been banished, no one expected them to survive, let alone remain united as a chapter. But survive they did, their disparate heritage bound by their faith in him on old earth. Nothing could ever shake that. Many Karkaradon's battle brothers carry abstract scrimshaw talismans, or decorate their armor with intricate and abstract linework. These talismans, etchings and traceries, often depict highly stylized images of fanged maws, death heads, oceanic predators and the like. This primitivism likely evolved as part of the chapter's unique and impenetrable culture over millennia of isolation. However, all this stands in contrast to the savagery they show to their enemies. Merciless is perhaps the best word to describe the Karkaradons in combat, but even that does not begin to describe the depths of blood-soaked slaughter to which they are willing to descend. They fight with a wild abandon that would make even the most impetuous space wolf take pause and they do not ask nor give any mercy to their opponents beyond a quick, though seldom clean, death. In a way, they seem to see the universe very much in terms of black and white, enemy and ally. Anyone who stands against the Imperium, for whatever reason, can only expect a brutal demise at the hands of the Karkaradons. Though it has happened only very rarely, lone space marines in dark grey livery and speaking ancient variants of High Gothic have on occasion arrived at the fortresses of the Death Watch in the Jericho Reach, in order to, begin quote, fulfill the obligations of their sworn oath, end quote. When pressed, some of these space marines have said that they hailed from a chapter known as the Carcharodons. However, beyond these rare encounters recorded in the dusty data vaults of Watch Fortress Arioch, the only information forthcoming on the Karkaradons are the stories of their mighty deeds throughout the Imperium. Nobody knows what Primarch's gene seed led to the creation of the Karkaradons. Opportunities to study the organs involved have been very rare and the Karkaradons themselves are singularly unhelpful in this regard. The only clues to their origin that the Death Watch have are from a gene seed extraction performed on a slain battle brother, recovered from a massacre site. The body was, supposedly, from the Karkaradons. 
The apothecary who performed the extraction later noted that the gene seed was untainted, if subject to a long-term degradation. More interestingly, the gene seed bore several genetic markers reminiscent of the Raven Guard bloodline. These markers are uncommon, and a link to the Raven Guard would explain several other details about the Carcharodons themselves. The appearance of all Carcharodons does share some singular details. They all have grayish, pale skin with an almost death-like pallor. Some of the most venerable and ancient Carcharodons have liquid black eyes, without an iris or sclera. Beyond this, however, there are no common phenotypes among encountered Carcharodons. This suggests that they do recruit from a wide variety of sources, and that their skin color and eye mutation is the result of their gene seeds alteration of their phenotype. These traits are similar to some of the traits of the Raven God. However, even if the chapter does count Corvus Corax as its progenitor, many millennia of genetic drift have likely created distinct differences. When traveling in the void, many Carcharodon's battle brothers sleep in individual cryotanks. It is how the chapter's battle brothers spend a lot of time dealing with void space. Existing in the lifeless dark beyond the stars is not an easy thing to do. The Carcharodon's Astra have been roaming it for ten millennia, cut off from all contact with the wider Imperium. The normal avenues for recuperation and replenishment utilized by Space Marine chapters are very rarely open to them. The suspended hibernation afforded by the cryotanks provides the chapter with a method of rest between combat operations and training cycles, and helps them preserve their strength. Typically, it is the younger brethren and initiates who utilize the tanks the most, overcoming deep void sickness through the meditational activities of the newly implanted Sassan membrane. Older Carcharodons usually find it increasingly difficult to rest, even through the longer voyages. It is said that the eldest of their kind haven't used the tanks for centuries. And this, my friends has been what I wanted to tell you about the Carcharodons for today. In case you are either wondering, or maybe getting bored of so much Carcharodons lore, there is just one more episode left in this miniseries. There is also a chance that I will put up that fourth video sometime during next week, and then do another chapter on Saturday. What are your thoughts on today's Carcharodons trivia? Let us know and discuss in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Thank you very much for watching and I wish you an amazing day. The Emperor Protects.